Hello everyone. This video is about the critical system heuristics. As you have seen, I've been posting a number of videos where I am explaining the different system methodologies or strategies we have in order to deal with complexity that uh, organizations, what we call systems, it could be a manufacturing company, it could be a group of friends, it could be a family, it could be a nation. How, what strategies, what options do they have in order to deal with these elements of uncertainty that we're dealing on a day-to-day -day basis? The situation we're having at the moment, I already mentioned this one, is an extreme case of what the environment can produce for the context of an organization. Complexity is better explained in terms of this pandemic we are facing at the moment. There is a number of elements that we were not aware of, we didn't know about it, uh, we were caught uh, out of um, context if you want, although uh, we know that things like this can appear from time to time, it was not expected and it has hit not only a, a specific region of the world but the world all over and this is something that is different. Of course, there are many elements associated with the health situation. There is an economic problem coming uh, next or alongside, and there are many other elements associated with the social, the political, economic, and the health problem we're facing. So this is an extreme way, uh, an extreme form of what complexity uh, could produce for the day-to-day -day operation of a system. A system that can be, again, a country all the way to a family. As a family, I'm pretty sure all of you have seen the consequences of this pandemic. At the nationwide level, we are seeing the consequences, and at the global level, we are also seeing the consequences of things like this. So this is an extreme form of complexity, and therefore we need to deal with that complexity in different ways. What we've been doing over the course of this model is to show you a few strategies in order to cope with those elements of or those situations where we have increased levels of complexity. Before I start with the explanation of the critical system heuristics uh, strategy or methodology, I would like to highlight a couple of elements. The first one is related with uh, an article written by Professor Mike Jackson who is the author of the books I've been uh, suggesting, and he talks about what is the actions that governments are taking in order to deal with this pandemic. I'm pretty sure you are fed up with the pandemic uh, problems and everything about this coronavirus uh, uh, thing, but um, this is a good way to explain a situation we're currently in. In the voice of Professor Jackson, I will save um, this uh, Professor Jackson contribution. I will upload it on Canvas, uh, he says that we were facing an uncertainty situation. Uh, we had a virus, uh, there were people dying, the problem was increasing, we were not uh, fully aware about the consequences, uh, how the virus was spreading, why it was so lethal, or we were not necessarily sure about the lethality of the virus, and so many things we didn't uh, knew at the time, we didn't know uh, uh, about the, the virus itself. So the decision by the government was to reduce the level of complexity. So this lockdown, uh, although there are many criticisms of the, this idea of um, isolating people, of slowing down the, the, the economies, what the governments have been doing is they've been trying to reduce uncertainty. By having, by having everybody locked down in their houses, you are moving the situation for or reducing the level of uncertainty, increasing the level of uncertainty. If you are locked down in your house, then you were, or the government or the health in, uh, instruments institutions were better able to trace how the virus was transmitting from one person to the next. What were the actual consequences? Why was it that the younger most in society were not suffering as much? So. One way to reduce uncertainty was to lock down everybody, to close the economies, to close the economic activity. That could be a, a decision that will come under scrutiny 
under scrutiny on the next uh, few years. But that was a decision aimed at reducing uncertainty. Of course, we're still in a high dynamic environment. The virus is still around, although it is uh, reducing the number of people uh, getting uh, or, or getting the actual illness, uh, sorry, the, the virus. And there is a small reduction in the number of people dying from uh, this uh, virus thing, according to the information we've been given. I'm not an expert, far from being an, ex an expert, but based on the information we've been given, we are increasing our understanding of the problem. Once you get to understand what the problem is, then you are better able to produce a solution. Of course, we can question so many things about this whole situation we're living. I understand there are people questioning everything, absolutely everything from the actual existence of the pandemic. I understand that. But based on the information we have, one way to deal with a problem of uncertainty is trying to move the problem either on this dimension upwards in order to reduce uncertainty and face a dynamic problem, or either moving a problem from a coercive situation to a pluralistic one. Remember, under a coercive situation, people are exercising power because they have because they detain the power because they are legitimately access to uh, have access to power, and they and in order to deal with a situation here, then you need to start identifying who is exactly exercising power, what are the interests they serve, and in a sense that help us to move the problem in this dimension. So this article by Professor Jackson says, the way, the systemic way, this pandemic has been dealt with is by the effect of isolation, we are increasing our understanding by moving an uncertainty problem to a dynamic one. Isolation has allowed the authorities to understand the, the, the problem because now we don't have the problem of contagion going around without any clear pattern. So again, you can question anything about this pandemic thing, but this is just to give you an idea or an example of what it means to reduce the level of complexity based on what we've been uh, reviewing. Going back to this matrix that we've been reviewing several times, I already mentioned critical system heuristics is a methodology, it's a strategy that according to Professor Jackson uh, as well, um, is a good way to deal with a situation where there is power being, uh, being used, power being used by somebody, and that somebody has to be identified in order to try to understand what is the source of a problem. So this methodology, this is a, as the usual, a quick presentation that you will have available on Canvas, um, comes from the work of two people, uh, Seawest Churchman and uh, Bernard Ulrich. Uh, Seawest Churchman, an American um, system philosopher, and um, Bernard Ulrich, a Swiss um, social scientist, and uh, this is their, their, their work. According to Churchman, um, to be a system thinker, to be a systems person, means when you put yourself in the, in the shoes of others, when you see the world through the eyes of another person, when you try to understand their point of view, that is the essence of this systemic. Remember, one of the problems we have is that all of us have a restrict view of everything that we are able to grasp, that we're able to understand. Basically because we have cognitive limitations. And second, because everything that we interpret, that we see, the world as we see it, it is understood through our own uh, values, our own history, our own experiences. So we have partial view of the things that occur out there. I've been trying to understand of this uh, situation we're living, and it's quite interesting with the internet these days that you get lots of interpretation of what is going on. From people saying this is a health crisis, uh, and they give you an explanation, a biological explanation of how the virus spreads. And then you can go to the other extreme when you have all these conspiracy theories of people saying, well, this is 
this is just uh, an hoax this is just a lie a big lie in order to and you have every sort of explanations uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure you have seen all these different ideas i'm not criticizing any of them none the biological explanation neither the conspiracy theories right but people who explain the problem we are facing from both extremes let me call it they do so because they are convinced the problem started or the problem origin is related with either a biological cause or with the obscure reason uh, associated with the power structures in the world so each of those two visions and many other visions in between are based on people's understanding of the world what is really going on we need to learn from all those different visions from all those different perspectives and that's what being systemic means you shouldn't be discarding any of these different views if somebody has a view about this is a conspiracy a theory aimed at whatever uh, they, they explain that's the reason from this pandemic the best thing that you can do is try to understand what are the reasons that it got Try to think in terms of the SAST methodology. What is the evidence that you got? How certain is that evidence? And that, that helps you to understand those other different point of views. And that is the essence of being a systems person. As such, there are no experts in the systems approach area. There are only practitioners. And uh, that's why the um, idea from uh, Churchman, C. was Churchman, uh, comes from the uh, fact that all these methodologies, all these strategies have a partial a benefit from practitioners. You can take, you can pick and mix from all these different ideas. The essence of the methodology is very simple. It is a process of scrutiny, of asking, of going deeper of what are the purposes of the, in the design and the implementation of a program. If you recall, during, I think it was the third of the tutorials, I asked you, we asked you, to analyze all these programs aimed at ameliorating, at reducing the effects of poverty. You probably remember this presentation. And uh, I, we talk about the work of the Bisa Moyo. She is an, an African uh, economist, an outstanding one. And what the argument was is, please stop aid relief. Aid is not helping. Aid is only helping corrupt officials to remain in power. Do you think providing aid, aid helps underdeveloped African nations or nations in different parts of the world? That is not the case. Stop aid. That is a particular view. That's the Mbisas Moyo's idea of what aid is. You want me, mainly you, went through a process of analyzing um, these um, eight programs and uh, we use the SAS methodology. Well, this process, critical system heuristics, can also be applied uh, in order to question ourselves what is the actual aim, the actual benefit, who is actually benefiting from all these eight programs. And that's what these critical system heuristics aim to uncover. Remember, we have a situation where power is being exercised. So we want to identify what are the sources of power, who's benefiting from the current sort of structure. The status quo is benefiting who? And that's what we want to question. That's what we want to challenge. That's what is called critical, because we want to scrutinize who's benefiting, who's been imposing power, who's been affect and who participates. That is very simple. Everyone who is affect or could potentially be affect by a program, by a decision, should be part of the design process. West Churchman and Bernard Ulrich uh, contend the process is aimed at imposing or at uh, having this critical idea where we want to question, where we want to challenge all the assumptions made, 
while designing and implementing the program. One of the uh, issues we face is, as we've been discussing uh, during the most of our module, we ultimately say, or I've been saying, we always have the system uh, for which we are designing programs, identifying um, improvement uh, actions, and uh, the system interacts with the environment. And the environment produces actions and effects uh, that alter how the system performs. But likewise, in the organization, in the system, we have the chance to alter the environment. And probably the best example I can give you is the current situation we have in terms of the oil market. If you have been listening to the news, probably you uh, found that the price of oil has collapsed. And it has collapsed for many different reasons. There is a clear reduction in demand. The whole world is in lockdown. There is a reduction in the consumption of petrol, and therefore there is a reduction in the demand for oil. Prices go down. But systems, countries, have been doing specific actions. There seems to be, there is an, a war, if you want, um, or a not coordinating action between different oil producing nations. So initially there was a disagreement between Russia and um, Saudi Arabia, and they made a decision to pump more oil into the market. So the price decreased even further. Last week they reached kind of an agreement in order to reduce the production of oil aimed at trying to alter the price. However, the environment believes they can do more. They need to cut oil production even further. And in a sense, they are, or the investors are not reacting to the action they are doing. So the system, oil producing nations, have made a decision to reduce the uh, production of oil, but that is not enough. So the environment is reacting back to an action taken, probably. I'm trying to anticipate these oil producing nations will need to cut even further the production of oil so that they can stimulate the, the price back again. So uh, well, just to close the, this thing about the oil thing, don't worry too much. If you have uh, investment in oil companies or if you are the owner of a big oil company, prices will go up next month, but not as high as they would like it to be. Probably will be around the $20 a barrel. But that, of course, is a different thing. Um, another important element is associated with, oh, sorry, I, I beg your pardon. I was trying to explain this. And one of the limitations we have is in the way we determine where the environment starts is a matter of judgment. As a company, where do you define where the environment starts? When you have a company, its environment, all the actions that are outside the boundaries of the organization, where the boundaries of the organization are drawn? Is it the boundaries of the premises? I'm pretty sure that is not the boundaries of the premises. As an organization, you have a number of customers, a number of suppliers. So are the suppliers here or the suppliers are part of the system? What about the customers? I'm pretty sure there is a clear integration between the company, what they produce, with customers and suppliers. So that is a, a judgment thing. That's a, a judgment made when we draw these barriers. And that's one of the problems we got when we try to think in systems terms. The other important element is that um, this concept of what, what uh, Ulrich called the boundary critique. That is, most our decisions, our views, have what he calls partiality. Whatever your decisions are, whatever elements you take into consideration, those are bound by our limitations to get into account all those elements that exist out there. That partiality, and that's associated with this idea of a boundary critique. According to Mingers, um, John Mingers, what it takes to be critical 
basically the idea, and I try to highlight a, a few elements, is to evaluate the validity and the strength of the arguments. When we have different ideas, right, what I want is I want to challenge your ideas, not because I'm a, a bad person or because I'm opposing you. I am critical because I want to be sure that what your position is makes sense to you and to me. So the best thing I can do is to ask about the validity of your arguments. That is to be critical. So when somebody has a different position to yours, the best thing you can do is to ask, how certain are you? What is the validity? What is the support? Is that support a solid one? So when you face all these different explanations of what this coronavirus crisis is, ask for the validity, ask for the arguments, ask for the evidence. That is to be critical. So that is, as explained by Mingers, going beyond the face value assumptions. All those elements, all these different positions about a particular course of action are based on a number of assumptions. So questioning, asking about the support, the validity, the elements that support a particular point of view, that is what is important of being critical. So every time you're given a position with all the respect, because this is something not everybody accepts, with all respect you can explain to somebody. Well, I am a system thinker. And as such, I'd like to ask for the support, for the validity of your arguments. I'm not acting or going against what you say. All I want to know is I want to be sure that what you are saying is something important so that I can act upon something I didn't know before. This idea of boundary critique, again, is associated with the actual effect of our actions. Um, what we decide has important implications beyond the reach of what we tend to believe are the boundaries of our actions. They tend to have a far-reaching uh, impact, even small things. And if the official narrative about this origin of the pandemic is true, people doing specific actions in a specific part of the world have changed the world over. The implications are far-reaching by decisions made by people in a specific uh, parts of the world. Remember, we want to reflect upon specific elements about how we design a system. What are the aims? What are the purposes? What are the interests that being served through the design of a system? How decisions are made? Who made those decisions? What motivations exist for people to make a decision? If you want to be critical in the sense of a systemic uh, point of view of all the decisions being made at the moment is who are making the decision? Who benefits? Are there any beneficiaries from this lockdown? Well, if there are, probably that's something you need to keep in mind. Is it the case that the main beneficiary of the lockdown is all of us, all the citizens of the world, who are having the chance to isolate without being, or without being exposed to the problems of uh, contracting a, the virus? If that is the case, fair enough. There are some people saying there are companies benefiting. There are powerful interests being served. Well, if that is the position, right, then those are the questions we need to ask ourselves. And of course, who are or, or what are the consequences of the current system in place? Remember, we want to take into consideration the point of view of those involved that have to be all those who are affected by the decisions. When you have only in a small minority of people making decisions, then this is something that brings a few questions coming to the fore. Is it the best way? Of course. Under the problem we're facing at the moment, the government is there to make decisions, right? They were elected, at least in the case of the UK, and 
as uh, citizens of the UK, we made the decision you guys were going to be in charge of running the government and were given powers to the government in a, in a company, in an organization, who's calling the shots? What are the benefits they are seeing? What are the consequences of the actions taken? And under this critical system juristics, the idea is very simple. All those affect by our policy should be involved in the decision process and also in the design process of the actions we are taking. We like to compare under critical system juristics between the system as it is and the system as it ought to be. What is the system like today and what the system should be like, ought to be? We want to compare between the two. And in order to do so, we want to contrast those positions between those involved and those affect. Those affect should be part of the ought to be because that will help us to avoid a problem of somebody imposing their own vision, using power to impose what they want. So the methodology, the process consists in 12 specific questions. Questions that try to compare between the world as it is and the world what it ought to be. So the questions are in terms of four areas, about the client, that is the motivations, who are the beneficiaries, who will get a benefit from the current system as it is, who ought to be, who should be the actual client. That goes really well with all these poverty programs. Who is the client? The client should be poor people. No rich government officials ruling poor countries. That is a comparison between what it, the system is, according to the vision of certain economists, like the Mbisa Moyo you referred before, and what the actual beneficiary of those uh, programs should be. Who's making decisions? When we design all these uh, anti-poverty programs, clearly the poor, the poor people, they are not being part of the decision process. That's why uh, some critics, critics of, of these programs call the white men burden. There are rich people sitting in beautiful offices in New York or in Washington or in London or in Geneva designing anti-poverty programs for poor people in the developing world. The poor are not part of the design process. Who are the experts? People sitting in New York or people living down there in the poorer communities and who are those affected by those decisions. So those three, sorry, those four, the clients, the decision makers, the experts and the affect ones, they should be part of the design process. So the question should be, who is the actual client of the design and who ought to be the client of the design? So when you are designing a program aimed at uh, improving the health condition of people, then you need to involve those who are going to be the beneficiaries in the design process. What is the purpose of the system or the design and what ought to be the purpose of the design? As you clearly see through these different questions, what we're trying to uncover is Sorry, if we are designing a system to benefit others than the intended, than the real beneficiaries of a program of action, what are the measures of success? If a measure of success is relieving people from poverty or it is just to channel funds to the poor countries, to clean our face, to create this feel right or to reduce our guilt from the level of inequality we have. In terms of the decision maker, who are making the decisions, who are calling the shots, who should be, who ought to be the real decision makers? 
what are the elements that the decision maker control and what ought to be those uh, elements the decision maker should have under control. When you design a system to provide assistance, assistance to the uh, poorer areas of the world, clearly the decision maker has control over how much money give to a specific countries. But that's it. How the money is spent is left to somebody else. That's why in so many cases, all this money intended, well intended, or given with the best intention to relieve people from poverty end up being uh, money used by powerful interests, by people in power to perpetuate their benefits. Because the decision makers, those who design the program, they cannot go down there in the ground to make those decisions. And that's one of the problems we have. Even though the, the, the design of the system or the, the, the people making the decisions about the actual operation of the system have the best of intentions, those, are not, those programs are not producing the intended benefit because the decision maker has so many elements beyond their control. In terms of the expert, who is involved, who ought to be involved? Is it the expert, people like myself, who study poverty through economic analysis, by reading articles, by having a beautiful office in a beautiful office, as it is my case? Or is the expert, people who go down there, who live, who experience poverty in the first person, they should be the experts. They are the experts. We are just academics, analyzing, understanding, trying to make sense. But we're not the expert. The expert is people who go down there to the ground, who experience poverty firsthand. Of course, this is what we what we do. In many cases, I don't want to like to talk about myself. I mean, in many of our cases, who teach about developing economics, we have experienced poverty, but poverty by going to uh, poorer communities and try to see life through their eyes. Apologies for this one. So that's why it is to be systemic. Experience of life through the eyes of others. And that is what experts should be doing, experiencing life firsthand. What is the type of expertise involved? What ought to be the type of expertise? Is it just people, economists, uh, academics, going to the uh, areas, poor areas of the world? Is that enough? Or do we really need people who is part of their communities, the way they understand the world, Clearly, the way we understand the world is completely different. Our ideas of what development is, is completely different. For people like you and me, probably development means having an easier life, to have uh, many things that we need in order to make our life easier. Probably for them, it's just to live right in um, consonance, to be attuned with, uh, with, with life as it is. Our concept of development might be different. That's why if you want to design a development program, that's why you need to get all those different visions into the design process. And also, what are the warranties? How do we make sure that the success of the program is in place or the elements are in place in order to guarantee there is going to be success? And of course, the role of the affect, those who are currently involved and those who ought to be involved. What are the interests? And this is quite an important element. Remember, what I've been saying here is we have people exercising power and that power structure increases the level of complexity we're facing. It doesn't mean we're breaking down the power structure. It might require a full revolution, but at least if you manage to understand who are those calling the shots, those currently uh, defining the measures of performance, those controlling access to resources, those defining the objectives for a program, at least you understand what the power structure is. You might not be able to convince people to give power away and sit with people having different ambitions and start a dialogue. In some cases, this power structure means powerful guerrilla groups, people with arms, they are not to give up their arms. 
But if you want to solve the problem, that would be the only solution. But at least if you understand why or where are these powerful groups coming from, where are the motivations, at least you increase your level of understanding. It doesn't mean you could solve a solution. As I've been saying time and time again, guys, and this is what I want you to remember, when we are not sure what the problem is, it will be very hard to provide a solution. All these strategies we've been covering over the course of this model are aimed at increasing our level of understanding. By asking these questions, we're trying to understand what is this power structure. We might not be able to move the power structure as a, a few inches where the, the, the power structure is. We might not be able to change the world as it is, but at least we'll understand who those powerful interests are who the people calling the shots are. And those are elements that help to increase our level of understanding. Okay. Uh, I really like this final uh, slide coming also from John Mingers. Uh, when he has this beautiful article, what it, what it is, what is it to be a uh, critical? And he provides these uh, warnings about um, this challenging process, challenging in the sense of challenging the accept decisions of asking questions. The first one is uh, criticism uh, tends to be taken negatively by those in power. When we have different ideas, let's say I have a contrasting view to what you want. If you ask me, what is your evidence? How are you sure? Sometimes we take it personally and we tend to act negatively or we can consider you're asking me because you are against me to consider that you are asking me those questions because you want to uh, bring down my point of view you are challenging me because you dislike me and this is one of the negative aspects we have so for most of the people asking them about a specific uh, uh, the basis for the preferred strategy tends to be taken in a negative way. If you challenge existing power structures, please don't be surprised if they retaliate in some sense, if they fight back. So if you go to different parts of the world and then you're trying to identify uh, what are the powerful motivations, then you are in some cases, going into deep water, right? Hot water in, in so many cases. Um, recently, I've been reading a book. Um, I, I don't try to do this, but I've been reading a book about uh, the Italian mafia and the connection with the Latin American uh, drug uh, dealing cartels. And uh, there is a beautiful, uh, well, not a beautiful, but a, a, a nice account of what's going on. It is written by uh, his name is Roberto, like me, Italian author. Uh, Sabiano. And this guy writes about the um, powerful uh, Italian mafia in the area of uh, Naples, uh, the Camorra. And um, he explains how this powerful uh, mafia works and the connection they have with, the, with some politicians, not only in, in Italy, but really anywhere in the world. And of course, uh, the Camorra groups have made the decision that uh, they are going after this guy. And so that's why he, this guy lives in uh, New York, in the US. He's, uh, he has made the decision to self uh, exile from Italy because he was trying to uncover how that powerful um, structure, uh, illegal uh, structure works in the southern part of Italy. So, of course, uh, he was uh, presenting, info, uh, giving important information how the uh, Camorra works, and of course there are close ties between the Camorra and politicians, again, not only in Italy, but in different parts of the world, the UK included, 
uh, the US, most of Latin America, and uh, of course, if you start revealing those secrets, you can expect that powerful structure to be going after after you if you are doing so. Of course, I don't expect you to go to do exactly the same, but at least to ask in the context of an organization, what are those purposes, those interests being served instead of the ones that ought to be, the ones that a system is supposed to be benefiting. So this finished the presentation on the critical system heuristics. Now, the tutorial uh, you have to do, I will explain it in, a, in another video, it will be relatively simple in the sense of, I want you to take the case of an organization. It could be, I choose a few ones. Uh, as you know, I am an economist. So I w uh, present this as an example. I want you to consider, to think about the International Monetary Fund. Uh, some of you might not like the, this idea very much, but I want you to ask, what are the intended benefits or the main um, benefit of the IMF? As you are aware, if you like uh, economic stuff, uh, they provide help to nations who are running into economic trouble. But of course, they give the money based on a number of conditions. You need to do A, B, and C. More often than not, it requires those countries to change the current economic system they have in place. In some cases, let me take just a single one, that requires privatization of state-owned companies. What I want you to do is, I want you to analyze what are the actual aims of the IMF and what ought to be, what should be, ideally, the intent benefits of the IMF. The other option is you can take the United Nations. The United Nations is the clue, if you want, of the coming together of all countries of the world in order to uh, have an agenda to improve the living standards of everybody over the face of the, uh, of the world. However, the actual work of the UN has been criticized by so many people. It can be, also, you can be analyzing the actual work of the European Union. As you know, in the UK, we made the decision as a, uh, as a country to leave the uh, European Union because in the mind of uh, some people, the, uh, the Union is not working as it ought to be. Well, what I want you is, I want you to analyze the context of one of these uh, multinational or uh, international agencies and compare what it is and with what it ought to be. I want you to provide an answer to all these different questions. Let me go back to them. So to go through all those questions. But I will explain that exactly in a different video. So guys, this finish uh, my presentation on the critical system heuristics. Remember, this is a process and a strategy aimed at helping us make sense of what the powerful structure is. We want to increase our level of understanding. As a consequence, as, um, as the byproduct of moving this situation from a coercive to pluralistic would be ideal. It might not be always possible. Okay, guys, as I've been saying before, I hope you are fine, you are well, please keep safe, and uh, please let me know if you have any questions. We are approaching the end of our term, um, and again, any questions, please let me know.